Welcome to day three of Advancing Inclusive Leadership at Penn Law. We are developing the first of its kind multimedia leadership education materials through conversation with leaders from around the world. Today's keynote conversation focuses on business as a critical global partner in crisis management. Last month at the UN General Assembly, marking the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, UN Secretary General Guterres called this moment in history, our own 1945 moment, a reference to World War II, a time that saw the world plunged in war. COVID-2 has unleashed a leadership crisis, a public health and economic crisis, that have revealed new fault lines and exacerbated existing divisions, both in the global order and in global and local business. At this unprecedented moment in history, we have with us Fumsili Mlambo Nguka, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Head of UN Women. She's also the former Vice President of South Africa, the first woman Vice President of South Africa and former Minister for Industries in South Africa with a deep appreciation and keen insight on how resources and reach of business can be mobilized for the public good, especially for the empowerment of women and minorities. She put in place many of the black economic empowerment policies that helped democratize South Africa's market economy post apartheid. And now as head of UN Women, Fumsili's mission is to bring that democratizing project to the world. We also have with us the honor of Max Grandrit. He is the Director General of GSMA, the Global System for Mobile Communications, a network of 750 operators from around the world. The way I'm going to frame this conversation, this dialogue between these two global leaders is by sharing with them two comments that they have made in relationship to each other. Max Grandred has told us I am committed to accelerating change and tackling some of the biggest issues facing our world today. And this includes bridging the gender digital divide. And Fumsili Mango Nguka has responded, Max Grandrid can use his vast convening power to nudge things in the right direction. There are certain people in a specific time and place where because they were there and made certain choices, they nudge others in the right direction. So it is once again, harking back to what we spoke on the first day of norm entrepreneurship that Cass Sunstein talks about in creating a cascade of new norms. And what we really need at this moment in time are those new norms and those new norm entrepreneurs. So this morning's conversation will focus on how technologies, especially mobile technologies, can accelerate financial inclusion and how mobile tech leaders need to step up to the charge because at this moment in time, we see that nearly 800 million people in the African continent are still not connected to the mobile ecosystem. And what we see is that 165 million fewer women than men own a smartphone. And boys are 1.5 times more likely to own a phone than girls. So COVID-19 has magnified these existing gender and racial gaps. And we are now at a point in time where we fear the rollback of prior gains. And this conversation will address how GSMA and mobile operators and mobile technology can rise up to these challenges. From Sealy, Max. I think I'll, I'll ask Pumsila to start. Uh, uh, Pumsila, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rangita. It's, it's wonderful to see uh, both of you. 
Uh, I have to say it's much nicer when I actually see you in real life, but we'll make this work as much as we can. Uh, you know, uh, the pandemic has uh, highlighted something that uh, we have been struggling to bring to the attention of policymakers in the majority of countries. Uh, MET became one of the partners uh, in the private sector that I look up to go to to help me nudge uh, policymakers uh, to embrace and to do more to make uh, to close the digital divide. And uh, we have been together in many uh, uh, places trying to be evangelists and COVID came and it was just night and day. Suddenly everything that we've been trying to say became very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that for instance, women, because they are predominantly in the informal sector, their lives came to a standstill while those who live in a technologically rich environment were able through their mobile phone and other means on the next day to get on with their work, to continue mm -hmm. to earn their incomes. For women, if they did not walk to the places where they needed services, where they needed to purchase things, they could not transact because they did not have mobile money and they did not have the gadgets uh, for them to transact. Now, this tells us that we need to address this because the poorest of the poor are likely to be, are being worst affected by this. Women are disproportionately affected by this uh, pandemic because they don't have formal jobs, they don't have formal contracts, they don't have insurance, they don't have savings, they don't have policies that are supporting this. And I think this is where we, people like me, Matt, yourselves, Rangita, we come in to push for a world that enables uh, these uh, uh, women also to find their place in this very important uh, epic moment, which is like 1945. This, we need the member states, in my case, to rise up to the occasion in the same way they did in 1945 when they created the UN. We need that level of the, that magnitude of interventions in order for us to, to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, Pumsil and Rangita, thank you so much for having me. And it's, it's always a pleasure to see you again, Rangita, but, but also to listen to you, Pumsil. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the work that you and you and women are doing. It's, it's hugely important. And uh, GSMA has signed up to the women empowerment principles, uh, which I'm trying to push as much as I can. I think it's a great set of principles that we should all try to adhere to. Uh, but it's quite clear so that in this COVID times, the, the knowledge of uh, our understanding of technology has become so much more important. For instance, we are now sitting using Zoom, using a digital tool, which, you know, I don't think that many of us were that fluent a couple of months ago. Now it's the way we conduct business. So clearly going forward, we see that 90% or more than 90% of future jobs will need to have a digital component. You will need to be fluent in some sort of digital tools. Mm. And by not including women, by not focusing on making sure that women are part of this revolution, we will stand a risk of having a, a serious bifurcation between the haves and the haves not. And we see that we have done pretty good I would say up to now, to try to close the gender gap. If you go back to 2018 uh, to, to now, 2018, there were 27% fewer women than men that used the internet. Today, it's 20%. So we have actually managed to bridge or make sure that 230 odd million more women are now using internet but there is a still a huge amount of women that is not part of this digital revolution, which is not acceptable for so many reasons. If you look at my industry, the, the mobile 
uh, technology industry, if you can say so, as a whole, we need to have all good talent. We need to be able to fish in 100% of the talent pool, not just in the 50% of the talent pool. So for us, it's critically important to get girls, women, part of this digital revenue. Uh, and if you look at the advantages of being part of, uh, of using mobile data, I think, Rangita, you said that there were 800 million people not covered. And, and according to our studies, that's roughly right. We, we normally say 700 million or so. That's the coverage gap. Uh, but there is a almost 2.8 billion people that lives beneath the coverage, i.e. lives beneath a, two, uh, a 3G or a 4G network, i.e. a mobile broadband network, but they choose not to use it. And then you have 50% of the world's population that lives beneath a mobile coverage and use mobile internet. So 50% of the world uses internet and predominantly you use it on a mobile phone. And then you have 43% or so of the world's population, the, the 2.7 uh, 2 billion or so, as I said, that uh, live beneath the mobile coverage, but they choose not to. And then you have the six, 700 that does not have coverage. So obviously addressing those is a coverage issue. And we need to continue to build out resilient networks. But in the usage area, where the, the brunt, the huge amount of people live, uh, uh, the 2.8 billion people. Now, why do people not use internet? Well, it can be affordability. It's too expensive. Or it is, uh, I don't have, I don't know how to use this thing. Uh, or there is, um, I only know that there's bad things happening on internet. Uh, or it could be the fourth one, which I think is the biggest one, is that honestly, there is nothing of relevance there for me. I have the money and I have the skills and I'm not that afraid of internet, but I don't find anything of relevance. So we need to foster, I believe, an innovative climate where we can have companies, startups, where I think women can play a huge role to come up with ideas that solves everyday problems using mobile technology. So maybe I should, I should stop there, Rangita, and, and over to you. So I would like both of you to look at the ways in which GSMA and mobile technology is helping during this time of crisis in so many different ways. As the Undersecretary said, in areas that do not have internet connection, but where mobile penetration is stronger, mobile technology is the connective tissue to accessing healthcare, to access education, and as sustenance because GSMA has played a key role in remittances and money transfers during a time when travel was impossible. So we are more and more going to be looking at a paperless economy and GSMA's mobile money is really part of this inclusive financial uh, well, financial inclusivity that is going to have the biggest impact on women and underrepresented minorities in the world. Those yeah. who need our help. So, yeah, Rangita. So, so uh, together with you and women and other UN agencies, we uh, we have launched in 2016 something called the GSMA Connected Women Initiative. And today there's almost 40 mobile operators. And you should know, you said 750 mobile operators. That is all operators. There are no more mobile operators in the world. So it's literally everyone. Uh, and 40 is therefore a pretty big number. <laughs> I was gonna say that. And, and so we have almost 40, 39 mobile operators that have committed to this initiative. And what, what does that mean? Well, it means that we are offering low cost handsets. We're offering skills, digital skills education, we're offering loans, we're offering mobile money setup. And mobile money is such an important thing. And I thank you for bringing that up, Rangita. Mobile money and paperless and into remittances. Today, mobile money 
uh, was launched together with DFID, the UK uh, Development Fund and GSMA uh, back uh, 10, 12 years ago in East Africa. Now it has spread, but it started in East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania. And today there are more than two, uh, two billion mobile money accounts uh, with a $1 billion per day transactions. So this is a huge money flow with so many mobile money accounts. And we have seen through our, our research that being part of mobile money, using your handset as the bank account, if you would like, sending money from me to Urangit or vice versa has meant huge amount for all the 17 goals. It is the thing that helps people out of poverty becoming part of this financial uh, new world and also using it for, for digital, digital, digital courses. Uh, so, so remittances is, is then a, a natural evolution of that. I think we now have more than 100 uh, remittance corridors. So between France and one country or between two countries in Africa, et cetera. And uh, roughly $7 billion or so of transactions are happening through these remittances. But what is important here, what is important is the cost of remittances, because that is one of the key barriers that people feel, I don't want to send this money because it costs too much. On, on, as a comparison, uh, $200 uh, costs roughly 6.7% on average to, to remit to someone else. With using mobile money or using the, the, the mobile remittance, it is slashed to half or 3.7%. 5%, I think, if I have that right here mm. in my, yeah, 3.5%. So it is a much, much more cost-effective way of using a, a, remit, a tool of remittance, which is hugely important. But another thing that we're doing within GSMA, together with you and women and others, is to uh, understand how would we, how should we bridge this digital divide between men and women? Because it's not that simple. And... Uh, a couple of areas. The first is that we are arguing with governments, ministers, and regulators that there needs to be a gender strategy. There needs to be a, a, a strategic view on how do we handle this in each country. That's number one. Number two is to uh, make sure that we address the gender disaggregated data. Today, there is only sort of average data, and average is not good here. We need to be specific on, on women, men, girls, uh, et cetera, and boys. So gender disaggregated data is number two. And three is to address barriers, because there are barriers, affordability, skills, all these barriers that we talked about, which are also part of, of issues for men, but they're more pronounced when it comes to, to females. Uh, and... Uh, and, and, and let's see now. Uh, and then we need to address the, the root causes. So once we know the gender disaggregated data, once we have the strategy in place, we can start looking at the barriers and we can address collaboratively uh, with other partners all these challenges. This is not one company, one industry uh, that can handle it. It needs to be a cross collaboration across so many different entities. And that's why I'm really proud of spending so much time with Pumsila and you and women who, who comes with this deep knowledge. They know gender, dis the gender disaggregated data. They know the policies. We come from a technology perspective and the marriage here is so powerful. And that's why I'm really happy and proud to sit with, with you Pumsila again, as always. So that marriage, as you said, is so powerful. And Fumsili, at, at the helm of UN Women, has been addressing the unprecedented shadow pandemic that has been brewing, that is violence against women. And the mobile is often the only lifeline a woman has to call for help in terms of violence against okay. women during a time of the pandemic. So I want the Undersecretary to speak about some of the ways in which mobile technology can help women and underserved populations in telehealth, both in terms of 
security, physical security, and in health security. I'm Secretary General. And then what I want you to do finally is look at how the mobile industry is, at, is the backbone of a growing burgeoning business that is looking at inclusive leadership as part of its mission. That what you're doing, Matt, and what Fumsili is urging you to do is to look at a purpose-driven business ethos. And that is all about inclusive leadership. So I want Fumsili to speak to both issues and then have you wrap up talking about the importance of seizing both this moment and the challenge. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks Rangita. Uh, let me just say that uh, when uh, uh, the mobile phones were created, I'm sure Matt, you never necessarily imagined that uh, it will become this gadget that has become everything to everybody. Uh, we need it for money. We need it to protect women from violence. Uh, we need it for job creation and for uh, increasing uh, the GDPs of uh, economies. We need it for information, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really is, is the lifeline. Uh, when it comes into the shadow pandemic of the violence, that we have seen in this time of the pandemic. Uh, it has been uh, very important uh, 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 to utilize uh, the mobile phone for women to alert people who can come and uh, save them when they were facing a crisis. Apps have been developed that enable uh, women to send a message to us to call on assistance for them uh, to come and, and, and assist them and to help women to be located so that they can say exactly where they are. We have uh, in this time uh, engaged many governments about uh, having hotlines and quite a number of governments did uh, uh, agree and the other extended the accessibility to the service or introduced the service when it did not exist. And women who had mobile phones therefore had a possibility to send their message to somebody. And as they were sending their message for somebody, they were also indicating where exactly they were so that they were able to be uh, sent uh, some, some help. We have also uh, uh, recognized the importance of uh, women uh, is need for digital IDs, both for the issue of sending money and other services. Uh, and this is something that I would love to hear what Matt uh, thinks about. Do you think uh, there is a way in which private sector, public sector, us as the United Nations, we can push for some kind of universal access to IDs in the same way that we want everyone to have uh, uh, the, the usual ID that we, we push for digital IDs uh, in order to make sure that women have these digital IDs which can serve them in so many other uh, 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 possibilities. Uh, we have seen, uh, and I know in Egypt, for instance, in uh, and, and, and many, no, not, just, not just Egypt, but in other countries, when it comes into delivery of social protection, and uh, providing women with cash transfers and other services that they were needing because they had no source uh, of, of, of income. Uh, digital identity were very important because they could prove that they have a child. They could prove uh, uh, who they are, that they were not double dipping, etc. But I think the world uh, is not well covered as far as that is concerned. Is this anything that we think uh, we, we can, in this situation of emergency, take on? Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, uh, you have two minutes to respond. You have just two minutes to respond. And I want to remind you that when you told Fumsili, that your goal is to tackle some of the biggest issues facing our world today, you still didn't know about 2020. 
<laughs> and so now you are really tackling one of the most existential crises points one, one. that humanity has ever faced. Yeah, Rangit, I mean, yes. Uh, how, however, I, in, a, in a weird way, you can say that 2020 has propelled the digital need for digital literacy and digital knowledge. So in a way, it has sort of helped uh, my course or our course at DSMN or all mobile operators. We were the first industry to commit to the 17 SDGs. And why did we do that? Well, because we, we have the most awesome platform on the planet. We connect two thirds of everyone. We connect uh, 5.1 billion people. And that's why we felt that making a difference has to be done. There's no better way of doing it than doing it through the 17 SDGs. Yeah. Clearly, responsible leadership means not only to make money, which is also very important, but not only that, you need to look at the people dimension. And that is what we're talking right here, right now about, but also the planet, the climate and other activities around, uh, around, uh, around the climate. So, so you need to look at the three P's here, the, the profit, the people, and the planet. If you are, as a leader, able to include all three dimensions, I believe that that is the way forward. I think that is where the, um, the, the responsible leaders uh, will, will emerge from. And then Matt, back to what Pumsilla said, which is so critical. There is according to United Nations, roughly a billion people without an identity today. And if you're not able to prove who you are, you don't exist. And therefore it's very difficult for you to be part of this digital future. Uh, I mean, I am not Mats Grandard. I am sort of my mobile phone number. That's how, how important the digital uh, life is. We have solutions and there are many countries uh, using something we call mobile connect it can be used can be called different things uh, but it's a two-way authentication uh, if you have a mobile phone uh, you will be able to a very through a very safe and secure way uh, define that yes this is Pumsile on the other and it's no one else it can only be Pumsile so there are solutions for this this uh, problem Pumsile and also when it comes to register newborn babies Yes. We have launched uh, such uh, applications uh, in many parts of, of Africa where you can now register a newborn baby within minutes instead of days where you need to go to several different government uh, in, uh, institutions. So certainly using the mobile phone, using mobile technology is empowering, make people feel safer, exactly what you said, uh, but also more included in society. Uh, having a digital literacy, I think, is critically important uh, going forward. And I, I do want and I do like to see leaders uh, with a strong purpose looking at not only profit, but also profit, but the people dimension and the planet dimension. So in wrapping up this keynote session, I can't do better than a core and summon up the spirit of Pumsili Mambo Nguka, who when addressing business leaders said, there are leaders out there who while watching the bottom line, realize to whom so much is given, much more can be expected. And Matt, you are one of those leaders whom Pumsili was not only addressing, but whose spirit she was invoking because you are someone who has risen to the charge, who has risen to this moment and who has shown that as a leader in business that much more can be expected of those who have the power, the purpose and the pulpit to be able to reach, have the reach to address some of the most challenges that that we are faced with at this current moment in time. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you from Sili for everything that you're doing. And we hope you remain safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye.